Hi everyone. So I guess uh, we can start first. If later on there are more people that join, I'll just uh, cover a bit of whatever they missed out. So, okay, yeah. So I will just introduce myself. Um, I am Noel, a year two student at NUS. And so currently I work part-time for Homas. And my work is mainly in ESCO and mainly backend. Yeah. So this workshop is actually quite informal. So if you guys have like, any kinds of question during uh, the workshop itself, you can just like on the mic and just ask because we are in a very small group today. You can also use the chat. So yeah, um, I, I guess like during the workshop itself, uh, I'll be prioritizing more on like intuition and like application of Haskell itself, rather than giving you guys like uh, formal math definitions of certain concepts. Um, so I guess before we continue, uh, do let me know if like the, what do you call it? The font size is too small and you can't really see, or like you guys can't hear me. Yeah. Uh, you can just do so through, through the chat if, if either is an issue. Yeah. Um, okay. So anyway, for admin, uh, let me just push up the latest changes. Okay, yeah, so um, you guys can just like pull in the latest main branch as I've included some more examples and like some slight changes. Uh, yeah, so later on we'll just be sort of doing some live coding. Like you guys will also work on some exercises that uh, is in the repository itself. So yeah, um, we'll just go through basic Haskell syntax first and uh, like make sure that you guys know what's going on because yeah, we'll we'll be talking about Haskell anyway, right? And then we'll talk about uh, recurring patterns and we'll learn ways of like abstracting uh, of, of what do you call it? Funny abstractions in our programs that we can we can use, right? So before we go in, into like uh, all of that, like Haskell syntax uh, and the recurring patterns that we see, we'll first talk about what we care about in our programs. So when we're writing like complex programs, right? Uh, I mean, we, we kind of still have like monkey brains. So we need to uh, decompose our programs into something smaller that's easy to like understand and solve, right? Like you, if you have a big uh, system, what you'll do is you'll break it down into smaller programs. So this is like decomposition, right? You break it down into small problems that you can solve and then you compose them back together to give you your, um, your, 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 your final program, which you can use to solve this complex issue that you have, yeah. And another thing we are talking about is relationships. So when we talk about like, uh, when we talk about maybe your, your types inside your, inside your programs, right? You don't talk about them in isolation. So uh, we always talk about things in relation to each other, right? I mean, cause uh, yeah, we, we talk about, when we are talking about programs, right? We're always relating something to, to another thing, right? Where we say, okay, this is the way they interact with each other. So we want to model that somehow. Right, so those are the two things. And the last thing is actually to do with um, more of like software engineering principles where we want to write programs that are maintainable. So the way we will do that is to write um, readable programs. So it is easy to understand a program. Uh, it is, a program is more readable if it's decorative. So what do I mean by decorative? So it's basically like, kind of like whatever you are, thinking about like in your mind, you can just like translate it in, into code. So you are declaring your intentions, right? Inside your program. So we actually see all of this um, in like concrete examples later. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we can just straight away go into the first, uh, the first topic, which is types. Yeah. So if you guys go inside the source folder, there's this, uh, file called types.hs. So this is like the, I guess one of the 
uh, building blocks that we use to build our programs, right? First, we talk about types. So we talk about the, the model, the way we model our system so that we know how to, uh, yeah, we know how to, we know how to design it, right? Because we have something concrete to work on. So we have a concrete representation of whatever our system is, right? Yeah. So yeah, we'll start off with types first. Uh, along the way, if you guys have any questions, just free, feel free to uh, ask me. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, this is basically just the module decoration. Uh, if you guys have programmed before, I think you guys may be familiar. I mean, some of you may be familiar with like Java, I don't know. But yeah, you basically need to declare, right? Like public class or something, or like package. Yeah, this is something similar. Like, you need to declare that this is a module. But, um, we won't go too much into like build system in this uh, workshop. We'll just treat everything as like a single source file. Yeah. So you don't have to care about like module system. Yeah. So okay. Uh so okay, before we go into types, let's just run through some um I guess fundamentals. So uh yeah, so let's talk about dynamic versus static typing, right? Uh does anyone like uh Oh, what's the difference? Maybe they want to share. Oh, okay. Never mind. I think I'll share. Okay. So, okay. Dynamic versus static typing. So, it's actually confused, I guess, quite a bit of the time with uh, strong versus weak types. So, I, I'll, I'll go through like dynamic versus static typing first and like strong versus weak types in the context of uh, Haskell. Yeah. So, okay. Dynamic versus static typing, right? This refers to like uh, runtime versus compile time type checking. So a uh, concrete example is like, for example, in Python. Uh, Python, you will do like runtime kind of type checking, right? Or like list. Yeah, these are done during runtime because these are like interpreted languages. Yeah. But um, for Haskell itself, right, you will compile your programs. And as you can see here, right, you do like type checking, right? You, you provide the types, and then you'll see whether the values actually fit into that uh, constraint, right? Yeah, so this is all done during compile time before the program is executed itself. Yeah, so this is the difference. And then there's uh, strong versus weak types. So this is actually quite big, I guess. Uh, sometimes uh, some definitions include like dynamic versus static typing and so on. But in our context, we are just, when we talk about strong versus weak types, um, we are talking about uh, using one one type as though it's, it were another. So, for example, in Python, right, you can do like one plus a string, right, and and that that works out fine, right? Yeah. So you do some like coercion, and you can you can convert like uh, strings to numbers, booleans to integers, those kind of things, right? So it's very convenient, I guess in like smaller programs that you write or like smaller scripts uh, to just like do this kind of uh, coercion. Because I mean, to some extent, it's quite intuitive also. Like you, you roughly know the behavior, but when you start scaling up and you need more uh, assurances, right? You need to talk about things in a more concrete way. That's when you will prefer like strong types, right? You'll talk about, because cause, um, a certain value will be of a specific type. Right, it won't be like you won't you won't be confused like okay this type can actually be of another that you can have different behaviors right when you talk about its behavior is quite like uh definite yeah so you have that assurance so in large systems you definitely want that assurance right like you won't behave in strange ways that you didn't expect it to yeah so okay here are just decorations of our primitive types so the first line here is actually like a type decoration. So on the left is just like the variable binding. And we'll just say that the variable binding here is of a type integer. So it's quite straightforward. Uh, and this is of type string and this is of type char. So we can just like put up the repo. So if you guys uh, open up your, your terminal and stuff, and you guys have installed the two chain, you can use something known as GHCI. Yeah, can you use GHCI to open this file? Okay, 
yeah, so you can actually run this in the terminal to just see like, okay, yes, this is actually one, this is hello, and so on, right? As we've earlier defined. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that works. And we can see the type also. We can see like what's the what's the type of like string, what's the type of string. Yeah, so that colon T there is just like a, a way, a, a macro to like, Help us check what's the what's the type of that value, right? And and, and it kind of and it matches up, and it matches up as well, right? Here it says it's of type string, and up here it's of type string as well. So yeah. Okay, yeah. So moving on, uh, you guys have any questions so far? No. Okay, I guess not. Okay, I'll continue on then. Um. Okay, so. These are basically the ways that we combine like primitive types together, or we can construct our own basic like, types. Right? Before I go into like all these combinators, like product types, some types, and so on, first I'll talk about like uh, type literals. So, okay, uh, let's have a basic type. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's just have new okay. type new data new equals. Okay, so this is like, I guess, the most, most basic of, of, of type literals. If you guys have programmed in this before, you know how you can treat um, your program as literals, right? And, or, or if you have worked with like enums in Java before, you can use like literals as values itself. So it's some, some sim similar notion here. This is actually like known as, the, okay, the, everything on the left of the equal sign is known as a type constructor, which we use to specify like uh, new kinds of types, right? Because we don't just work with primitives, they will be quite uh, useless. You want to uh, construct more complex systems which have different kinds of behavior. So you use like different kinds of types for it. So yeah, uh, there's new. So this is your type constructor. And on the right side is our data constructor. So this basically just gives you like a, a value which is of type new, yeah. So we'll derive instances for it. Uh, I won't go into deriving just yet. Uh, you can just like copy whatever I'm doing and yeah. But this basically just allows you to like uh to, to view what, what the type looks like, like to have a string instance for the type. Uh, we'll go through it during type classes later. So you guys can actually see what I mean by like all this. Yeah. So okay. So if we just reload it, colon R just like reloading. Oh, decorations of new. Okay. Yeah, so I declared new uh, further down the file. So maybe we'll just use uh, this is this end. Okay. Yeah. So we can reload it. And we can see that uh, let's just have a variable binding to A. So you can see that we constructed a value of type A, right? So we, we can see like the type of A, what's the type of A is A, yeah, as we earlier specified here. Right? Type is A. And now if you evaluate, uh, we, show, we show the representation of A, right? If we show the representation of A is A as well, right? As, as defined here. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, moving on, now that you guys have some, like, I guess, basic understanding of, like, the type constructor and the data constructor. So, again, type constructor is on the left, data constructor is on the right, okay? Uh, now you, get, you guys have some notion of it. Let's talk about the ways that we can combine types together to build more complex kind of uh, modeling for our programs. So, okay, here we have a, a user, uh, we, we declare a user type. So what is the definition of user? Maybe in our system, we want a user to have a name and a age, right? So uh, it's, it's quite decorative. We just say, okay, user has name, age, right? And we use this, this is known as a data constructor, as earlier mentioned, to construct our user type. Sorry, to construct a, a value of the, the type user. Yeah. Then, here, what is the type of name, right? Because uh, name is 
probably not a primitive, like it won't be a primitive, right? Primitives are like strings, integers, and so on. Name is not a primitive. But what we can do here is that we know that we want name to be a string, right? So we just de uh, declare a type synonym. So to further clarify what I mean, uh, type synonym is basically like, uh, they are exactly of the same type, right? But you want to uh, just use the word, uh, the, sorry, the, the type constructor name as like to denote string, right? But it becomes more specific because if you wrote string here instead, this will be vague, right? You won't be clear about like what exactly is the second parameter. You just know it's a string, right? But if we put name here, it'd be very explicit saying that, okay, this is a, a name we are talking about, right? And in, in the future, if we want to be more specific, we can add like stronger types to this. Yeah, I will explain that further yeah, later on, yeah. So, okay, uh, I mean, to demonstrate this behavior, right? Let's just show like how that it can be, uh, is, is the same as string essentially. So, um, let's have Joe. So Joe is a string, right? Type of Joe. So you can see here that Joe is a string. So, okay. Cha here, right, is synonymous to string itself. So there's, there's no difference. Yeah. And we can also like bind, we can also say that Joe is of type, um, Joe is of type name as well. That, that, that doesn't matter. And we can say like Joe equals to Joe as well. You can see that this works out fine as well. This type checks, right? And you can see that it's name, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, so name is, is like a type synonym. Right? You can treat like values of name as type string. So moving on, uh, we have like age, which is a uh, type synonym for integer. And yeah, so here is an example of like us uh, creating like a user called JSON and binding it to this variable. And with this type decoration, right? This is of type user and this is, um, yeah, this is basically how we construct it. We apply the data constructor to the two arguments, JSON and the integer. So this gives us JSON, user, user JSON. So again, we can uh, derive a show instance for this to see what it actually looks like. So this, so let's see. User JSON gives us this, right? This is what it actually looks like. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now I guess we'll go to exercise one. So you guys can uh, take some time to go and try to construct uh, a product type representing a food order. So yeah, you guys can just try that. I'll give you guys like around five minutes to just try. Yeah. Uh, G. Yeah, I guess one minute. Yeah, I don't think it will take that long. Okay. After that, I'll just show you guys like how to do it. If, yeah, so if you guys aren't sure, you, you'll be able to see how to do it as well later. Oh yeah, also later on, if you guys have some specific areas that you are interested in, right? Like, feel free to ask me. Uh, yeah, it's like, because it's quite a small group, right? I can afford to like focus more on certain topics. Like if you guys are interested in monads or like whatever, yeah, just feel free to sound out. I will dedicate some time to that because I'm not sure whether we have time to complete everything. Okay, so I guess I will just continue to go through like how to construct food order. So here, food order is it, as specified here, right? You it should have a cost, and it should have the order itself, which we specify as like a string, right? So let's just show that 
yeah so basically we just do the exact thing that he mentions like uh should have paused which is yeah a flo floating point so uh, that means it can be like uh 13.22 or something like that right that's a decimal yeah and then uh string right and we can do the same thing as we did earlier which is to provide type synonyms so we can do like cost equals to float to make it more decorative and we can say order equals to string. Order. Okay. So yes. Uh that's it. Yeah. So uh you guys can see like uh I guess this this these are called product types as we as we earlier mentioned here. I didn't really talk about what uh what product type is because I think first we talk about the, the, the intuition first. So now let's talk about why is it called uh a product type. So let's take an example of uh something finite. Okay. So let's see. Okay, we should don't need to take something finite. Okay, we can just take the use user type that is earlier mentioned here, right? And we'll provide you some examples to see like why is it called a product of types, right? So data user equals to name H. So let's show other examples of yeah, so data Joe is type user, user Joe is equals to user. And we can have more and more, like we can have user J is type user. So you can see here, right? If we so now you can see like there's quite a few different kinds of of um what do you call it values, unique values of the user type, right? In fact, there are like uh infinitely infinitely many right? because there can be so many like this can be like infinitely many strings and infinitely many like uh okay I mean okay sorry int int is int is bounded but in the case where it was like uh, unbounded like a natural number right. You will have infinitely many like uh values of user, but how many values like how how do, do we decide how many values do we have right? We can do it by taking the cardinality of the variables right and and multiplying them together. So, uh, so yeah, in this case, it will be like the number of strings we can have multiplied by the number of values of h that we can have and that will give us basically all of like which is infinity yeah, basically yeah, but basically all of the uh permutations of users that we can have right so that's why it's called product because you will take like the first uh and second uh values and you'll like multiply like cardinalities together yeah so that's like yeah like taking the their product right so that's why it's called product right? And uh, and that will give us the resulting cardinality, which is the number of like users, uh, of, number of values of users that we can. Have. Yeah. So okay, uh, so that now that you guys know that, okay, we'll go on to sum types. Yeah. So a very simple sum type. This is like, uh, analogous to boolean, right? Where a result. Can we can we can we can model a result as either a success or a failure, right? So we know here, right, that uh the the reason why we call it a sum type is because you you can see that the cardinality, so the cardinality of the comp of of the sum of its parts is equivalent. Uh, you just need to add them together, right? Instead of instead of multiplying them together as we did with product type, you need to add them together, right? So this is there's only one possible um, on on the left side of this sum combinator. Uh, there's only one possibility, right? This cardinality one, and on the right side of it, there's also cardinality one. So in total, right, the number of uh results that we can have is two. So let's demonstrate this, right? So uh, let's just make success equals to success. 
and sub and failure equals to failure. Oops. So you can see here that uh, there's two unique types, right? Success. Uh, okay, yeah, so there's only two possibilities, right? Either failure or success. So inside the type itself, right, is of cardinality too, right? Because we can have like two unique values, right? So that's what we are like, talking about. Yeah. So, okay, let's see how this can be useful. So, I mean, Boolean, you guys know definitely it's useful. Result also probably, you guys can see like how it can be useful, right? But there are other like uh, usages of, of it as well, right? So we talk about something known as the optional type. So uh, many languages now have this, like uh, Rust has optional type, OCaml, uh, Java also has optionals. In Haskell, we just call it the maybe type, but all these are like essentially the, the, the same thing we're talking about. But what exactly is uh, op optional type? So uh, you guys can try it. I guess I'll give you guys like one minute to just try, try this out. Just see like where you guys can define an optional type. Yeah, then I'll go through the example again. Uh, for those who just joined, right, and you guys are kind of confused, feel free to like sound out and and just go through up, go through like because we didn't really go through much before this, so. Okay, let me know through the chat. Okay, so I'll just continue to demonstrate like how, how to define this optional type. Um, so optional, right? Uh, it can be nothing or it can be some value, right? So we'll just do it like so, right? Either it's none or it is some value. So it's some A, right? So here, uh, as we earlier mentioned, right, the cardinality is just the sum of these parts, right, which is one here, right? There can only be one, uh, uh, none here, and plus some a, right? A here, it depends on. Okay, so a here is polymorphic. We can like fit in. We can fit in anything we want, right? We can fit in a boolean here. We can substitute in a string. We can substitute in a user. Sorry, and it can be of any like. It can be of any type. Yeah, so, uh, what's this? oh yeah, so, okay, yeah. So it basically represents like this junction, like it can be either none or it can be some value of A, yeah. So if we talk about the cardinality, so for example, if we do some Boolean, right? In total, the number of values that we can have of this is true, it's just some true some false or it can be done. So you can see here, right, it adds up, right? Here on the right-hand side, our cardinality is two. So it's some true, some false, so that's two. And on the left-hand side, the cardinality is one. So in total, it's two plus one, and that gives us like this, right? Okay, yeah, and, and you guys can see how this can be useful, right? You can represent like, uh, sometimes you do not have a proper result that 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 you return. And yeah. Uh, okay, so that's optional type. And lastly, we have uh recursive types. So, uh, recursive types are basically like 
uh, like this, or yeah, I think this is the pre the most common one. Yeah, uh, you have this, you have trees. Yeah, basically you have like all these kinds of uh, recursive structures. So here we can define a list recursively, right? It can either be an empty list, or it can be the product of an of 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 an element and the rest of the list itself, right? The head of the list and the tail of the list, right? So, okay, we have defined that here. And so we can represent like this singleton list, right? And we can have, we can have like uh, uh, infinitely many possibilities, right? So let's talk about the recursive aspect first. So uh, if you guys notice, right? Here, the type constructor, is mentioned again inside the data declaration, right? Where we actually put it inside here, right? So what does this actually mean, right? So, okay, the left side is a given, right? We know that this just basically represents an empty list, right? But on the right side, what does this mean? This means that we have a value uh, of A here, and then we have the rest of the list, right? So as earlier mentioned, we talked about head and the tail of the list. So here we do it recursively as well, inside our type declaration, Inside our type declaration, we said that this is the head of the list and this is the tail of the list, right? Which is the rest of it. So the tail of the list logically, like is also of type list, right? So that gives us this. Yeah, so basically you just say that, uh, yeah, this, this gives us the rest of the list. So, and, and you guys can see this as an example, right? Like uh, when we construct a list of just one element, We'll use this cons to just uh put an element on top of, 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 of our list, right? So this is of type list, right? As earlier declared here. Right. And here we are consing like the one on top of it. So if we look and see like how this looks, okay. Let's just show the singleton list. Right. Uh and, and we can have even more like uh like we can have a longer list, so we can have like a list of three elements, maybe. So three list. So we can reuse the singleton list here, and we can const two more uh elements on top of it. So we'll just like const another one, and maybe const another two. Yeah, so here we have basically a list of three elements, right? That we constructed. Yeah. So you can see here that it is as such as well, right? Yeah. Okay. So now that that is done, uh the next exercise is to just try to define your own recursive types. So instead of uh a list, we are now defining uh non-empty list. So just think about like how you will go about defining that. And you can actually just reuse the list type here, right? So I guess the hint is like, uh, if you have a list and you add an element on top of it, you always have a non-empty non list, right? And so the base case of list is new. So if you add one element on top of new, that's like the base case, right? To get a non-empty list. So you can think about how you want to uh, construct that. But the other way is to construct it recursively as well. To say that the base case here, right, has a single element. Yeah, so try to define that because that will be the recursive uh, definition. Yeah. Okay, we'll just take a minute to try that out.
Okay, and now we'll just go about defining it. I'll provide both definitions, but I'll talk about the recursive one first. So as earlier mentioned, it can be a list of a single element, right? So it will be single A, either that, or we can then recursively construct it again and just stack elements on top of it. So you observe here that, oops, sorry, we cannot reuse it because it's once in some as well. So we cannot, okay, we cannot reuse it, it's not your flash. So let's call this uh, one, two, Yeah, so that works out fine. And we notice here, right, that we have asserted, right, that all of the constructors uh, make it such that the non empty list has at least one element. So this is kind of like the power of, 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 the, of like a type system, right? Like you can make certain uh, things unrepresentable, right? So you can basically make certain errors uh, invalid, right? So imagine, like, if you try to extract an element out of a list. Right, you can think that uh, that will very possibly fail, right? Because uh, if you don't like do proper error uh, accession handling and stuff, and you try to extract an element out of empty list, you will definitely throw an error, right? But here, if we are working with um, uh, values of type non empty, so basically, like the type would say that okay, you can always get a value of uh, I can always get a value out of a non empty list, right? So you can see here that. This uh, basically just uh, allows us to restrict uh, the number of errors that we can have even more. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the decoration of non empty. You guys can just try to construct it if you guys want. Uh, yeah, this is basically just to make the program like compile and ignore this. Um, okay, so we'll be moving on to the next part, which is pattern matching. So I think pattern matching you can see it in most like uh languages. Yeah, a lot of modern languages nowadays have like some sort of pattern matching. Um yeah, so uh pattern matching. Okay, so okay, yeah. Earlier on we'll, we we declared the result type and we are just like uh redeclaring here so you can just uh use it. I'm not gonna talk about import system, so I'll just redeclare it. So here you can see that uh, our function, right, it does like pattern matching. So what is like the benefit of it, right? The benefit of it is that again we can just like essentially write what we are thinking, right? Where we say that okay, if we show a result, right, uh, if it's success, so if it's success, then we just write the pattern here. It should return success, right? So this is like uh yeah, you basically just better match on like the the inputs, right? That is if it's a success, you should return a string success, and if it's a failure, you should return a string failure. So this is very decorative, right? And now if you have like uh a user, we can also like uh show the user's name, right? So uh imagine that uh the user has the first name and last name. So here, this will refer to the first name, this will return to the last name. And let's just see like how we can uh, demonstrate that. So here I've shortened the variable names, but we can expand it to be uh, more decorative. We can just say like first name and last name. So we can see that we pattern match on like the structure that we declared, right? Yeah. So user, first uh, value, second value, right? Same thing here. User. First value, second value. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. So, here what we want to do is just you know, uh separate or uh, concat them together with uh, the this case. Right. So yeah, this is basically just allows us to like pattern match on the types that we have. And we can even like pattern match on like infix data constructors 
So you can see here that the shape here is exactly the same here, right? I'm gonna talk about, uh, okay, so uh, infix data constructor is basically, so, so there's prefix and there's infix, right? Prefix is the default, uh, where you see that the data constructor is all the way on the left. And infix, the data constructor is in the middle. Right, that's, that's all that, that it means, right? Yeah, so anyway, you can just match on the shape of it and you can get like out the values from it. So this is a very convenient like uh, language feature that is used pretty often. So uh, it's basically allow, allows you to like declare your intentions very clearly. And yeah, you can also pattern match on like non-empty, uh, a non-empty list that we mentioned uh, earlier. So, oh yeah, this, I forgot to declare it just now, but this is the other definition that we're talking about, right? That if you add an element on top of a list, you will always get a non-empty list, right? Yeah. So anyway, uh, you guys can try this out. I'll give you guys a minute to try this out. So just like, yeah. Uh, after the workshop, I'll be uploading like all of the source files that uh, all of the source files here that, 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 that I've worked on. Here. So, oh, yeah. So, anyway, what H should do is you should extract the first element of the list, and tail should uh, extract the rest of the list itself. So, H should pattern match on this and give us the first element. And tail should pattern match on, on the second part, right? And give us the second, uh, the, the, the sorry, the, the second part of our uh, data constructor, okay? Of our data decoration, sorry. So if you guys are not sure, right, you can take a look at this and, and just like see how, how we do it. It's basically the same thing. Okay, so I'll just give the solution. Uh, so if you guys do, and we, if you guys do this, okay, we don't care about the rest of the list, right? So you can just return A itself. So this is exactly what we did earlier with uh, our product type. And we can do tail also. So, Oops. So if you guys uh look closely, right, you will observe that yes, this is the expected type signature. Uh taking out empty list and extracting out a value, right? This test hit. But uh, there may be some confusion here that says that, okay, if we take a tail of a non empty list, how come we get a list back? And that's actually valid. I mean, if you think about it, right, and you take a, if you take a tail of a, a non empty list with just one element, right? So, uh, an example is this, right? Clearly, this is a non empty list of just one element, right? And so, if we take a tail of it, it will give us back the empty list here. So this is no longer a non-empty list, right? It's a, just a list, yeah. So that is why you can see that it drops down and it just becomes a, a list. Yeah. And you can see, you also type checks, right? The second part of it should just be a list itself. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, this gives us AS, right? Which is, which is the second part of it. 
And so, yeah, we are done with like pattern matching and how it just works in Haskell. So, uh, you guys can definitely see how this can be useful, I guess, uh, in like using it decoratively. And now, okay, we'll move on to functions. So, there's only like two more, like core, I guess, core concepts that we need to go through before we we'll talk about more exciting parts, which is like monoids, functors, applicatives, and so on, right? Yeah, but. But these are useful as well. We talk about like, decorative features. Um, yeah, so basically, this is just uh, some simple Haskell syntax. I'll just fill this in uh, rather than making you guys do it because I think it's quite straightforward. Uh, and you guys, if you guys aren't sure, you can uh, take time to go and figure it out on your own. Okay. So, IDA, um, what it does is basically it just takes in an argument. So an argument, and it returns us a value, right? And this value has to be of the same type. So we can, id is just the identity function. So we'll just return the value itself, right? id a equals a. Okay, so that's quite straightforward. And now we have the addition function. So if you want to add a value to another value, we can just use the primitive add, like the primitive plus operator. So let's just see how that is done. So, so I mean, uh, there's no not really any purpose in declaring at here. Uh, yeah, just just it's just for the sake of like demonstrating or like a uh, function with more arguments and more functions. Yeah. So to read to understand like how to read this uh type signature here, right? Basically, you can treat it like uh from from left to right. So. First, you take in an argument. That's the first argument here. Then you'll take in a second argument. And you'll return the final uh, value itself. So that's the simple way to interpret it. But later on, when we talk about higher order functions, that's when we'll talk about like another way to interpret this. Yeah, but for now, you can just treat it as like taking one argument, taking another argument, and returning the result. Yeah, so anyway, next you have like the safe head of this. So earlier we talked about uh, safe functions, right? Like if you try to extract a value from a list and what if the list is empty? In the case, how do you represent the result? Because you can you just throw an, I mean, because, because you want things to be pure, right? You don't want to just throw an error, right? You want to result, return a, like a concrete representation of, of this. So how can we represent it? So earlier, right, we talked about the optional type. So we can use the maybe type, which is like it's actually the same thing, right? So here we do pattern matching again. Uh, empty list. If it's empty list, what do we do? We return nothing. So just for reference, let's see the definition of maybe. So data maybe is equivalent to either nothing or just a. Right, so you can see that this is exactly the same. I mean, we're just changing our names, right? It's exactly the same as what we declared earlier. Right, we're just changing our names from just to some and from maybe the optional, nothing to none here. So anyway, I'll just comment this out. So yeah, we don't have to declare maybe because it's already declared inside our base set of libraries. So yeah, we don't have to redeclare it. So I'm just showing you guys this for reference. So yeah, anyway, yeah, if you try to abstract uh, a value from empty list, right, you may or may not get a value. That's what we call it, like maybe, right? You may or may not get a value. And so if you don't get a value, it will just be nothing, right? Like as earlier mentioned here. So uh, also as earlier mentioned, we talk about like how some type is uh, either or kind of thing, right? Uh, disjunction, right? So here we will return like the yeah either, which is nothing, right? So in the case that we can get like a value, so again, we do pattern matching. So you can see here that the data constructor that list uses is in fix as well. So for reference again, we'll just see how that is done. Again, list is um, part of our base libraries as well. So yeah. 
uh, okay, so it is equivalent to it is equivalent to either empty list or you can cause it. Yeah. So this is a, this is like basically the declaration of, of, of this type. So we can do pattern matching again, right? We pattern match on the first part already here. Then we can pattern match now on the, on the second part. So we say that, okay, now if there is a, an element that we can extract out, right? We'll just return it. So it just X. So that gives us, oh yeah, we can just ignore this. Yeah, so we can ignore the tail of the list because we're only talking about like the head of the list, right? Which is yeah, X, yeah. Okay, and now next, we want to talk about save tail, right? So again, for empty list, there won't be a tail of the list, right? Because you can't, you can't possibly separate it out into like the head and the tail, right? So again, if you have empty list, it will be nothing. And now if we have some value, uh, instead of pattern matching on the first part of it, we'll pattern match on the tail of it. And return us that, oops, is it safe tail? Yeah, safe tail, okay. So yeah, that gives us the second part of the list. Yeah, so that's basic like functions and like how you, how you can understand that. So now we'll talk about higher order function, right? So this has to do with like the idea of reusability, right? Then we have general functions that we use and we can use this to generate even more functions that are more specific to various use cases, right? But like certain patterns that we see, we can just like generalize them into higher order functions, right? And yeah, we can just reuse this. Okay, so let's continue on. Uh, when we are now talking about, uh, we are now talking about the map function. So I think, yeah, most languages, most like modern languages will have map by now, uh, which basically allows you to map over a list, right? To convert like all of the elements into uh, other, other elements, right? So, when we talk about higher order functions, right? What, what are we talking about? Map here is a higher order function, okay? But what, what exactly are we talking about? We're talking about a function that either A, returns a function, or B, takes in a function as its argument. So you can see here that map here is a higher order function because why? It takes in a function as its first argument, right? So we can see clearly that map is a higher order function. It also returns a function, but uh, I'll go into that on, during the second one instead because it will be confusing to think about two things at once, right? So just treat it as it just takes in a function as an argument, that's why it's high order. So now if we map a function over MPDs, clearly what will happen? We will get MPDs back, right? If we map a function over a list of uh, elements, right? We can just recursively apply map. So we'll get fx applied to map fxs, right? So here we can just uh, we are do recursive application where we take f and we apply it to the first argument and call map on the rest of it, right? So we can, you can see how this will then eventually evaluate. Uh, to applying the function f against the whole list, all right. So you can notice that uh, the the useful part here is that uh, we can replace this f with any function, right, that matches this shape, right. So we can have like so 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 let's see see what I mean, all right. Like, oops. So we want to load. Uh, 
function small. Okay, yeah. So maybe we want to add one to a list of uh, numbers, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, we want to add one to a list of numbers. And we can also like convert all of them into strings. Right, it's, it's basically like allows us to generalize. Like you can use any kind of function that you want as long as it matches the type signature here, right? So yeah, uh, that's convenient. And now we have something known as like, uh, what, what it, returns, it returns a function instead of right? So that's not immediately apparent, right? Isn't this just a function that takes in a single, uh, taking, takes in two arguments and returns an argument, uh, returns a single value? So like, which part of this uh, returns a function, right? Yeah. So, um, okay, in Haskell, right, currying is supported. So what do I mean? There are, in this, for this function, right, there are actually three ways that we can represent it. So let's just go with the most obvious way first, and then we'll talk about more ways that we can represent it. So here, um, subtract takes in two numbers, right? Uh, and then what it does is that, uh, you will subtract them. So n1 minus n2. Okay. And yeah, so we will then get the value of the subtraction, right? So another way that we can define it is this way. You can see that it returns another function that takes in the argument n2. And then evaluates to n1 minus n2. Right? So these are exactly the same. You can see it type checks as well. Uh, yeah, you can also try it out as well. Uh, yeah, some check. So that, okay, there's another function inside our base library that's called subtract as well. So we'll just add the apostrophe here to distinguish it. We'll reload it and let's try subtract. All right, it gives us negative one. Okay, so um, yeah, basically this 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 works as expected. Uh. Yeah, so you can see here that we can just partially apply functions, right? Like we can apply it just to the first value and we can get a function back. Then we can feed in the second argument and so on. So the way to think about it is this, right? So earlier when we did subtract one, two, right? What, what we can do, it, do instead is we can do this. We apply it to the first argument, which is one. So now we get this function back, right? Then we apply it to the second argument too, right? So this becomes, um, so, so sorry, subtract one equals two. And then, Subtract two equals to the application of this, the first function here, to the argument two. Yeah, okay, so then this gives us 
the final result, which is just one minus two. Yep. So the key idea here is that if we apply just one argument to subtract, if we apply the, the function subtract to just like one, yeah, the first argument, right? We will return the function, right? This is very clearly a function. This is a lambda function, right? Where, where like this is the head of the function, the variable binding, and this is the tail, the body of it, right? So let's see like inside the type signature itself. So you can see here that if we add parentheses, you can see here that if you take a single argument here, you will return a function right? of type A to A. Yeah. So that's basically subtract. And yeah, you can see that it does this, right? Uh, in, other, in other languages, you are not able to do this. Like in JavaScript, if like, for example, you have function, F and you declare like okay, I haven't written JavaScript in a long time, but you can't apply F then to like just one itself, right? If not, you'll just assign B equals to now, right? And you'll just apply the function anyway, right? To these two arguments here. Yeah, so that's uh like high order functions, and as the two examples, which is one. It takes in an argument and second it returns a uh, it takes in a function as an argument and two it returns a function as a, a result. Yeah. So I'm just gonna comment this out so we can continue to type check. Oops, this was wrong. Okay. And you guys can play around with this to gain a better intuition. Uh the best, yeah, that's the best way to like, understand uh carrying uh in, in Haskell, yeah. Okay, and I'll go through the last part, which is like partial application. We sort of talked about it just now. So this line here talks about partial application. But I'll go through it more definitely. Then we'll go for like a short break before we continue on with the rest of uh, the material. Yep. So here, sub one, uh, we can partially apply. It. Oh, sorry, uh, sub one. Okay, yeah. yeah so let's, let's, let's construct sub one through subtract here. So let's reuse it. So how can we reuse it? We can partially apply subtract, right? As earlier shown, we can say subtract one, right? And that gives us, um, and that gives us our sub one function, right? Now this is a function that we can reuse. So we notice that um, from subtract, right? We gain a host of like useful kind of functions, right? That we can we can we can make it more specific by just like partially apply partially applying it, right? Yeah, we can partial partially apply high order functions because they give us more specific functions that we can use in a variety of ways. So we can have sub two, we can have sub three, which you may need depending on different contexts. So yeah, this is how we can generate sub one, and we can just use it as well inside our repo to just see that it works. Some sub one to so sub one, two. so sub one two will just be one minus two, right? Sub one three will just be one minus three, yeah. Yeah, and of course we have our other function. So what we want to do here is that we want to reuse the, we want to reuse map. So earlier, right, I showed you guys that you know we can add parentheses here, right? Uh. Which and it will be the same thing, right? So similarly, right, we can add parentheses here, right? After the first argument, we add parentheses to just see how that works. And we notice that if we partially apply map, if we just fit in a function, we can get a new function here that works on this, right? So okay, let's call uh, let's let's have a adder. So adder here, right? Uh, what what function can we take in? Uh, we can take in. Sorry, Adam will take in the least. Oh, okay, uh, we want to reuse the map function there, right? To get that uh, second argument. So we can have an adder of of one. So this because so this basically allows us to add one to a list of numbers, right? Yeah. So 
the result of that is adder one, two, three, four, right? We get two, three, four, five. Okay. And yeah, so you can see how this can be useful. Like uh we take map, we make it more specific by 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 applying it to class one, and then we can reuse the adder function in areas that we need to like just uh add every add one to the whole list or maybe we want to show we want to display the whole list as a string and so on like there are a variety of ways that we can do this yeah so yeah that's it for the first part after the break i will go through type classes then we'll go directly into like uh, the patterns like monoid applicatives functions and so on yeah uh you guys can ask questions now so Is the pace okay so far? Is it too fast or like, is there any part that is a bit ambiguous that is not very clear? Okay, I guess not. Oh wait, oh okay. If you guys want me to provide more examples of certain parts, just let me know. I can provide more examples. Uh, we'll take a break for around like fifteen minutes, I guess, and we'll continue on. So yeah.
Okay, I guess we can continue. Okay. Where did we end? Okay, so um, let's go into type classes. Okay, so yeah, let's start. Uh, okay, type classes. Okay, so you can treat them as like a type family, right? That uh, you can bundle certain traits of types together. So, uh, let's talk about uh, yeah. So so let's 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 talk about that, right? Um, so for for all of our types like integer, boolean, and string, and so forth, right? They have something common, right? Is that we can have some uh, verification of them, right? We can see how they look like. So, for example, uh, a value of true, we can represent it as a string true, right? We can verify it into a string, right? And we can do that for like Boolean, we can do it for strings itself, we can do it for numbers and so on. So you can see here that they share some trait, right? And to be more concrete about it, um, type classes, they will basically act on like types, right? They'll be, they'll, they'll, they'll declare like instances, right? Of, of, of these type classes for these various types. And then you associate methods with them. So you can see here, the first type class that we'll go through is a, a very simple type class that basically says that for subtype A, we have a identity function. Here we just call it identify because we don't want to clash with uh, the ID function inside base. So what identify does is basically it takes in a value right, of, the, of the specific type here and it just returns the value itself. So you can see here that we can do uh, it for Boolean. Uh, we can do it for like uh, many other kinds of types. Basically any kind of type, right? Because we can always return the type itself. Yeah, we can always return the value itself. Sorry. So here, uh, we can be even more explicit to say that identify true, we'll return true. Identify false, we'll return false as well. And you can see that how that how it, it was equivalent to like this. These are equivalent. Okay. So a uh, short exercise that you guys can do is for all of these types. Uh, sorry, for, let's see. Okay, just for the result type, uh, you can declare the identify and for this as well, declare, sorry, for, for receipt, declare identify function. You okay. just try it out. Yeah, so I'll give you guys around like two minutes to declare instances. So you can essentially just like uh, do the exact same thing here right? for result and for receipt types. Uh, after that is done, I'll just uh, write out the instances for you guys.
Okay, so continuing on, uh, you guys can either like uh, expand it out, but because this is just like the identity function, right? You can also just like write it something like this, right? You can just say whatever uh, result I'm taking, it doesn't matter, just return it back, right? You only pattern match when there's a purpose behind it, like, or uh, there's different behavior with failure or success values. But in this case, the behavior is the same. You we'll just return it. So, yeah, you can see that it works. Okay, and uh, okay, uh, now, yeah, I'll just group all of the instances together. Okay, yeah, now for these following data types, right? Uh, we will go through the declaration of like uh, EQ, uh, ordering, and show type classes. So I'll just show you guys an example for um, the identity type. Then uh, you guys can go ahead and try out for result and for receipt to see uh, how you can declare like EQ which is equivalence, ORD, which is uh, ordering, and show, which is basically converting it into a string representation. Okay, so yeah, let's start off with result, uh, and I'll show you guys how to do it. So result here, uh, failure with failure is obviously true. Right. Uh, and success with success is true as well. Right. But otherwise, so we use the underscore here to denote like that it matches anything else. Uh, we always return false. Okay. So that's for EQ uh, result. Uh, something convenient that you guys can do when you're looking up like type class declarations, right? Okay, either you can Google it and use something called Google. Let me just send it in the chat. Um, can you use something called Google? So this is like uh, used to search up um, type class. You can use it to search up anything like related to Haskell, I guess, like modules, functions, and so on. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you can use that, or you can also use the repo. So here, I can look up uh, the EQ uh, type definition, right? The EQ type class, sorry. So uh, colon I just basically gives me the information of the of whatever I specify. So you specify, it will show like EQ here, and you will talk about the instances that already have pre declared. And you also show you the associated functions here. First is the EQ, which is like basically just comparing two values, right, of the same type, and returning you whether it's like telling you whether it's true or false. Like, are they equivalent? If they're equivalent, you return true. If they're not equivalent, you return false. So yeah, you can just like uh, see like oh, how is the class defined? Yeah, using this colon I. C. Yeah. Okay, so now that you guys can see like how this is done. Uh, you can do something similar for receipt as well to check for equality. Uh, I'll take you guys along like one minute, one minute to just try that out, and I'll go through that. Okay, so yeah, let's go through the answer. Receive a uh, string ID and price. So how do we check if it's equivalent? The most straightforward thing is to just compare the values itself, right? Inside receipt. So we just say like 
okay, is S equivalent to, oops, is S equivalent to S1 and I equivalent to I2 and P equivalent to P1. Yeah, so we can do all this. All right, oops, I2, sorry, I1. Okay, yeah, so that, that, that works out fine. And for ORD, you can do similar thing as well. I won't, I won't go through it because it's quite like repetitive. Uh, instead, what I'll do is, uh, I'll just jump straight into uh, why this is useful, right? Like, uh, why having a type class uh, with methods uh, is useful. So, you can see here, right, that type classes have associated functions, right? So, the EQ type class has the associated function uh, of the equality operator, right? This associated function. Now, the ORD uh, type class, which is the ordering type class, has the associated value compare, right? And finally, the show type class has the associated function show. So uh, what we can do, right? Okay, so for example, if we want to uh, compare if two values are equivalent, right? By unifying uh, all of this under this single function, right? Because we, we could, I mean, we could have declared three distinct functions. So we could have declared um, equality for Boolean values. We could have declared uh, equals string for string values. And so on, right? But uh, this is all uh, repeated, right? Like we have to declare like repeated functions together. We cannot use the same function, right? We, it's all called other different things. But the notion of equality is all the same, right? Uh, which is we are just comparing the values itself. So uh, that's why, like, you can just unify all of them and just use like common interface, right? When we're talking about equality, so. You can ignore the, 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 the implementation details of it, right? You don't have to care what is inside. The only time you need to care is when you're declaring the instance itself. But otherwise, the interface is always the same, which is this, right? You're just using the equality sign, uh, the equality operator here. So you don't have to care about like, oh, what's actually inside and so on. But you get that like uh, assurance, right? Because you can just declare in one place and just reuse it uh, everywhere else. Just uh, you just need to declare it once inside the instance, and then you can just reuse this operator everywhere else. Okay, yeah. So anyway, you can do that similarly for comparing. You can do that similarly for showing and so on, right? It's very explicit. Rather than having like a equals show equals this or what, where you're not certain, right, that the behavior is exactly the same, right? Here we are very clear that uh, the interface and based on like the types and stuff is always like uniform. So you can try that out for yourself as, as, as per usual, like you can just like try to declare all this. Uh, I don't think I will provide the examples for this. Yeah, I mean, if you guys ask me to provide it, uh, I will I'll provide it, but you guys can easily find all of this like uh, online, yeah. Okay, yeah, anyway, we'll go on into like the meat of, I guess the workshop, which is um, the, uh, algebraic like methods that is inside uh, inside our programs yeah so first let's talk about uh monoids okay so the big picture right first like why even are we talking about monoids functors applications and so on like what's what's the point right like it just sounds like like a lot of math and I want to just get things done. Right? So what's, what's the point of learning all of this, right? So the point of it is that we will see some recurring patterns, okay? So if you, if you look at the type signatures, right? You will see some recurring patterns. If you, if you look at the values, you'll see some recurring patterns. So if we see these patterns often enough, we can basically come up with some abstraction over them, right? 
which is what we did for type classes, right? For almost all types, there's some notion of equality, right? So for all of these types, you can group them under the EQ type class and say that, okay, these are all, uh, these all have like the, the equals operator associated with them. Right. And, and similarly here, we are looking for some common pattern that we see in like uh, all of these different types and grouping them under like all of these uh, other kind of type classes, right? That talk more about like uh, their structure or like uh, certain properties of the type. So let's go into uh, detail, see like concrete uh, examples of this, right? To understand like why this is useful. Okay, uh, this part will be a bit more dense. So, if anything is unclear, please do let me know so I can like I can I can talk about it more. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, when we talk about monoids, right? What are common occurrences of monoids in like uh in in I guess in your normal programs, right, or in the world? Uh, we will talk about things like integers, like uh adding integers together or like multiplying integers together. These are all like uh, monoidic operations. Uh, concatenating, like concatenation of two strings together. That's also like a monoidic operation. So these are things that uh, occur pretty often. And so we can like find some way to uh, abstract them, right? So let's just see like what's the commonality between all of these patterns first. So here, uh, oops, sorry. Let's 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 first see for addition, right? So we know that if we add uh one and two, we get three. If we add more than one value together, we get like we can do this. So if we do this, it's exactly the same as. It's exactly the same as this, right? So this is known as associativity. I think most of you should know this, like yeah, associativity, right, of the addition of this. Huh? And this is also something known as identity, right? Where if you add zero to anything, it will give you that thing back, right? And it doesn't matter if you if you reverse it. Right. Whichever way you add uh the identity like which is zero here to like the other value, we'll get the value back. So similarly, right, uh for this uh yeah, for this, right? Similarly for this, uh we have our MPs as the identity, then we are talking about concatenation. So if we concat something with the MP list, we'll get it back, right? And it doesn't matter if we change the direction of it, like if we did the opposite, we'll still get it back, right? So that's, you can see that there's a similarity there. Next, if we, whichever, whichever order that we concat our, our, our list in, right, it's always the same, right? If we, if we concat like in this order, we concat in this order, Or if we do it in the other direction as well. It will give us the exact same list back. So there's this notion of associativity and identity, which are the core laws of like um monoids, right? So we notice that we are buying like monoids to a specific type, right? So we'll say that this type has a property of a monoid. Then we can just use like uh we can just just use like the common interface of monoids for all of these like types that satisfy right that satisfy the monoidic uh, laws. 
So the last are stated here. I talked about them roughly just now. So the first one is associativity, which states that uh, if you add whichever whichever order you apply like uh your what do you call it? Whichever order you apply the operator in, it doesn't matter, right? It's it's, it's equivalent, right? Then there's left identity, which says that you know some value plus the identity will give just give you that value, uh, identity plus some value just give you back it, yeah. So this is the idea of it. It's quite straightforward, I think. Yeah. So semi group is basically just like a monoid, but you don't have the identity loss holding, you just have associated with you. Yeah. Okay. So if you see here, right, I'm just going to declare, uh, this is a natural number, right? We can declare natural numbers recursively. So it will be like, uh, for example, the, the natural number two will just be sub, successor, successor, Right. So this is equivalent to two. So the exercise then will be to declare like a monoidic uh instance for it, right? To see like so uh in this case, uh there's two kinds of monoidic instance you can declare. So if you if you think about uh monoids, right, you notice that it is not it's associated to a specific operator, right? Like a speci specific binary operator here, like addition. But you can also do the same thing for multiplication, right? In the case of multiplication, our identity will be one, and our uh, yeah, our our identity will be one, right? And the and the associated binary operator will be the multiply operator. So you guys can go for either. I think that the uh, I think that the addition. Uh, addition for uh, natural numbers will be simpler. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, yeah. So you guys can just try that. So you can treat this as the addition operator and try to define a uh, semi group for it, which is just like, uh, yeah. You just adding stuff together, and you can try to declare like um, M and P is the identity here. So declare the identity for addition and declare uh, and this one is declared for you. So you can just ignore it. So I'll go through how to do it in like one minute. Okay, so let's declare the addition operator, right? Which is monoidic, and we can just use this again, right? So adding anything to let's just add uh oops, adding two natural numbers together. Two, uh, so new plus anything, right? We'll just give us that thing back. Then if we have successes, right? Uh we can add them together, right? So so we need to deconstruct the second successor.
So you can see here that uh, we are just adding one and then we are slowly like intercity deconstructing n2 right? and sooner or later you hit the base case which is new. Uh, in that case it will just return n1 and then we'll have recursively built up a series of sucks here which is equivalent to like our n2 right? and above successes for n2. So anyway, yeah, this is the definition for it. And for MMT, this identity, it will be just new. And map is like we declared it earlier. So yeah, that works well for us. So for uh, extra exercise, right, you guys can try uh, declaring like the multiply operator instead for natural numbers. Yeah, so you guys can try that out on your own time. We'll move on to other abstractions. So next in the line is functor, right? So functor is useful because we always see this like uh like occurring, right? Like be it for lists, for maybe types, for uh for maps, yeah. Most things have like some sort of like most like container like structures or like uh even functions themselves can be fun are, are functors, yeah. So let's just see how we can uh, talk, let's, let's see the laws first, right? The defined functors. So here, right, uh, the laws here don't really give, I guess, intuition. Intuition comes from like the implementing all of these like instances yourself. Then you'll get a better understanding of like how functors behave. But I'll just go through the laws, uh, yeah, so you guys uh, know what sort of behavior you can expect. So. Um, this basically means that if you go into your structure, right, and you apply a function into values inside your structure, right, it is the same as applying ID to the structure itself. Okay, I think I should just go through the instances first. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think I'll go through the instances first, then I'll talk about the loss. Okay, so functor, right, has this uh, function associated with it. Earlier, you all saw that. Um, there was like the equalities operate, equality operator associated with like uh, the EQ type class, the binary operator, which is like, which, which was this, associated with a semi group and associated with monoids, and the show and so on, right? So those are like associated methods. So this is associated with the function type class. So you notice, right, that there's a shape here, right? That you take, you take a function. And you apply it, right? So the function here takes in type A. And if you apply it to a functor with values of type A, you will get values of type B back, right? Inside the same inside the same function. Right. So let's see like a concrete example of this through a simple like uh data type. So this data type is known as the identity data type. Okay, you may occur it occasionally, but for the most part, you won't really see it. But this is basically just like a thin wrapper around like any type, right? This, this is polymorphic, so this can be any type. So if we add it, right? Uh, let's see what we get. So so add mapping this, right? Will just give us back. The same thing, All right? Because we reserve, if you notice here, right, that the outer uh, functorial context, right, is preserved. All right, there's no, there's no change to this type here. So, similarly, here, right, identity here is preserved, right? We still keep identity, uh, which is like our functorial structure here, right? But what we update is the values inside, right? So we apply F to the values inside, which is A, right? And we can see these type checks, and yeah, this is basically like the functor instance for identity, right? Now, similarly, right, uh, we can do something for this. So F map here, right, is analogous to our uh, map function. Uh, so it's analogous to our map function for like this, so you can try to define like the exact same thing. Uh, so fmap 
similar to map on the empty list will just give us back the empty list. And F map on the non empty list. We can just recursively apply our function f to each element inside the list, right? But this is exactly the same as like mapping over a list. So uh, we apply it to the first uh, item in the list and we'll recursively apply this to the rest of the list as well. So you notice that uh, this basically provides us a very convenient way to like. Uh, talk about uh, functorial context and also like values within, right? If you just want to update the values within without touching or changing the external like context in any way, you'll use fmap, right? Because this just updates whatever is inside without changing the structure. So you see here, right, for the list, right? When we fmap a list, we don't like add any extra elements to it. So for example, if we did this, right? If we added one as we did earlier, to we just get a list with the same four elements, right? We don't get like extra elements, like five elements and so on. So the external structure is still preserved, right? But we get to specifically change the values inside, right? Yeah, so um, you can see then how this satisfies, like uh, this gives you certain guarantees, right? And this is where we talk about the functor laws itself, right? So if you have map ID, what does this mean? This means that you're not doing anything to the values, right? And F map shouldn't change like uh, the external context as well, right? So it's essentially just the identity function. So if we F map ID on a list, It should be equivalent to the identity function applying on this itself as well. There shouldn't be any difference. All right. Because we A, we don't change the values. And B, we also don't change the uh, external like the extra functional context as well. So this is the first assurance that we get. All right. And the second assurance that we get is uh composition of like uh, morphisms or composition of our functions, All right? So suppose uh, we applied two functions, right? We, co we, we compose two functions together. Okay. So if you added one, if you, if you added two first, then we added one to a list of numbers, right? It would be the same as doing this. So it is exactly the same as doing this, right? That uh, if we if we if we first compose the functions together, then we apply it to the structure. It is the same because we don't change the structure in any way, right? We can also do this, right? So this is the second thing that we, we talk about, which is like composition of morphisms, right? If we compose them first, then we fmap it inside. It's exactly the same as we fmap them separately and we just apply them, right? So basically these two assurances give us like uh, the confidence that we don't change the structure in any way and we just change the values inside, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll just give this here as an example. Yeah, and finally there's um, the example of a uh, functor for the function itself. Um, okay, I'll just show you guys uh, how this is implemented. I won't really go through it because it's a bit confusing to go through. Yeah. Uh, if you guys want, because it will take some time to like explain like what exactly uh we are doing here, right? So I'll just give you guys the instance and like talk roughly about what it is. And if you guys want to uh gain like a deeper like uh understanding of this, just just let me know. Yeah. So F map uh f of g, right, basically just says that, okay, what is our functorial context here? So let's, let's, let's 
uh, talk about a, a concrete function. Right, suppose we have a function. Uh, integer to string, right? So the functorial context here that we are talking about is the integer part, right? That we, that we say that this part, right, shouldn't change, right? The behavior shouldn't change. It should still give us like the values itself. So we want to just operate on the value itself, which is string. Okay. And we don't want to change like the way the function behaves. So the way to do that is we let the function operate first, right? So after G gives us our result, for example, we fit in G, uh, one to G, right? And we get a string back. So if we get a string back. So notice here that we don't up change the function anyway. But what we can do after that is that once we have obtained this value here, we can then update it, right? We can then uh, apply another function to it. And we can convert it to, I don't know, a uh, string of two, of two ones instead, right? We can, we can, we can duplicate the, the string. Yeah, so notice here that we don't change the original behavior. We just do like function composition essentially. Okay, so this is just defined then as function composition, right? That if we f back a uh, function f into another function g, we just apply the original function. Then uh, the f net function, right? The lifted function f here, we just apply it to the result. Okay, so we, we, you notice here that we don't change like the behavior of the original function, we still use it. It's only the result that we touch, right? So this should give you how some some intuition, I guess, somewhat of like uh, the functor instance for uh, functions. Yeah. Okay, and so that's I guess it for functors. So so far, is there any questions? Like any part that's not really clear? Uh, yeah, I hope I've provided you guys some intuition. I guess we take like a five minutes break to just like think through about like this and see if there's anything that's confusing. Okay, we can continue. Okay, so now we are left with uh, applicatives and monads. Uh, okay, applicative patterns are harder to like show, so I'll go with like monad patterns first. Uh, applicative patterns are rarely seen. Uh, monad patterns are very common. So let's just give you guys a scenario first. So, okay, when, when we talk about monads, right, uh, Let's talk about some concrete instances first, which is like okay, we want to we want to suppose we want to have functions which log some uh we do some logging, right? So in a in pure language, right? If for example we want to log to to send that out, right? In JavaScript we will have some function f and inside what we can do is we can just like uh console.log. Right. And 
uh, maybe this function is a uh, add one function. Okay, let's just use the add one function here. So the add one function, um, what it does is that it just takes like uh, just add one s s one to a right. So we just return a plus one. Uh, and and we want we wanted to do some logging right. So we basically just log the we want to log um all of the inputs right to say that okay this is what. Uh, this is maybe some uh, critical piece of uh, functionality that we need. Okay, so we we'll need to log it, right? We need to log the inputs. So we'll just like log it to console, right? This is something that's quite common, I guess. So this is known as something known as a, this is something known as a side effect, right? Uh, nowhere inside the arguments or the return, right? Or the return value, right? That we say that uh, we return the value of console log, right? There's no uh, indication that we return. I mean, similarly, similarly in Java, right? Even though Java is strongly typed, you also don't, you also don't, uh, what do you call it? Declare this inside your return type as well. So, uh, maybe you have a function in Java. Let's just have, let's just write that. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure whether I'm writing it correctly, but it should be the bar shape of a Java function. Uh, to return, uh, right. So we do the exact same thing. We do the exact same at one function. So here you notice that similarly, right, in the return type, we don't mention any note, uh, we don't, we don't talk about uh, returning any IO as well, right? You just like call it. So it's a side effect. Like nowhere in compile time will you know that this happened. Right? The compiler can't tell you that this happened. Right? Maybe you can do some sort of other static analysis, but the type checker itself won't tell you that this this happened. Right? You can even do things like delete uh your entire file system and the type uh, checker will still type check. But you can't do this in Haskell, right? Because uh, function in Haskell has, has to be pure, right? You kind of have like this kind of side effect inside. So the equivalent function in Haskell This one type check because this explicitly returns a type of IO, right? So you notice here that the type checker prevents us from doing this. So in that case, how do we return like any kind of logging action, right? Like, how is it possible? So, uh, well, we can do it in a pure way. So, I mean, similarly in JavaScript, right? We can just return like a tuple, or in Java, we can just return a tuple with the string. Uh, which is represent the logs, right? We, we, which represents the logs, and we can also return like the result of it. So in Haskell, this will be So you notice here, right, that we can then just return it, right, in the in the result. And this type checks as well. It checks that, okay, there's an extra part that we return here, which is the logs, right, which is just a string of, yeah. So it's just a tuple of the string and the result, right? And we know that, okay, we can show integer as a string, right? So this is all that this means, right? Just show the string representation of the integer and return the result as well, right, which is n plus one. Now, uh, this is a pure function, so that means that we can test it, right? We can unit test it because we can uh, test the, in some sense, the side effect as well, right? Because this is actually a value, right? It's not like this, that this is not a value at all. This is just like an effect that we can't like capture at all, right? So, but the problem comes when you want to do composition. So, uh, 
earlier it was trivial, right? If you wanted to compose uh, two functions that added one, that added two. So suppose we have this function, right? Add one, that add two. Composing them is trivial, right? You can just add one to n. Uh, let's define add one and add one. Yeah, so composing them is trivial. We can apply add one first to n. Then we apply add two, right? We can compose them this way. Okay, so that's that's trivial, right? And oh, okay, I declare it further down in the file. So let's just differentiate it. Okay, that works. Okay, so we can just do add one and add two. And we have this operator that I think I kind of showed you guys earlier, which is like the composition operator, right? So it's same as in math, right? Uh, f g x oops or g equals to f dot g x right this is known as the composition operator right so it's exactly no it's exactly the same like as as you write it in mathematical notation and one there two is the same as composing the two functions together right using the dot so now we have a, a convenient shorthand for composing functions, right? However, this function here, right, is not composable in the same way. So let's see what I mean, right? So suppose now we have had two, right? And we want to do the same sort of like composition. Uh, let's have, let's, let's, let's distinguish, let's make it more explicit by adding this to the calculation. So suppose we want to compose these two functions together, right? So we realize that there's a there's a difference here. So earlier, when we look at the type uh signatures of this, right? This returns an integer that we can then pass into add two, right? We can chain uh, this and this together, right? We can just we can just combine them together, take the result and pass it into the, the next function, right? That's exactly what uh, composition does. But here we have an issue. We cannot take this and pass it in because the types are different, right? Like the type. The, the type of this is a tuple of string and integer, which, which contains like the logs and the integer. And here is an integer itself. However, what we can do is that uh, we still roughly know how to combine them. Right? We still roughly know how to combine them. So let's, let's, let's try to compose them. Okay. So how do we do that? Uh, we need to join this with the result from here somehow. And we know that the logs, right? We want to collect all of the logs. So we want to take this log and take this log here, the two logs here, and we want to combine them together somehow. Right. So so let's let's see how that is done. So we want this to lock, uh, lock everything inside, right? So we can do it by passing it in, right? So we can say, uh, let the result of applying uh, add one lock to n 
ici. Okay, so now we got the result from the first application, right? The first function that we applied to n. Okay, and we got a lot from it as well. Now, next, what, what do we want to do? Uh, we know that we want the same behavior, right? Like, we want to pass in the value here as the argument to add to log. Right, similar to what we did here, right? If we take the result of n one and we pass it into n two, right? So that behavior is the same. So we don't know yet uh, what is actually this, right? But we know that we want to pass in, right? We want to pass in the result of the first application in. Okay, and now we can just look at the type, right? Okay. This is of type string integer. So can we just uh, return this? So let's see, right? So n2, and we just say that uh, we return it, right? But here there's something wrong. We just applied, uh, we just pass in n1 to add to log, right? Which gives us, yeah, which gives us the logging uh, for this, right? But it missed out the logs from the first part, right? Notice here that log one is underlined because we didn't we didn't use it. We should have uh, correlated it somehow with the second log, right? So here, what we do then is this. We can concat the logs together, right? So, uh. Yeah, so so then this gives us this leave, this preserves that, that functionality, right? So you notice that somehow we compose these two functions together. Then the thought comes uh being that is there a way to abstract this composition? Like uh do we see this pattern enough? And is there some way to talk about the way uh it behaves, right? And that's uh when you start saying that okay, uh maybe monads can can fit in such here, right? To uh Say that this obeys certain laws, right? So let's uh talk about um the operator here that we are using, right? So uh at the end of the day, right, we do some composition here. We are not we are not too sure how, but we want some uh abstraction that basically allows us to compose these two functions, right? That we don't return external context. So this is analogous to this. So the composition of functions here and the composition of, of, of like these functions here is roughly the same, right? Like you notice that we, we want to do some composition, but uh, we aren't sure exactly how to define this. Okay. So in that case, uh yeah, exactly how 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 exactly do we like define define this operator here, right? So if we think about it on more abstract terms, previously we defined some instance for this, right? Which is a uh, monoid. So we can replace it because we know that for list, right? Um, the concatenation, the, sorry, the monoidic operator is essentially a uh, concatenation. So we can just do that replacement there. So, uh, yeah, basically we can just uh, we can just observe this, um, yeah, and let's see like uh, another another common pattern that we see, right? So in, in Java there's something known as flat map, which is essentially uh, the bind operator in Haskell, right? But let's see like how this is being used. So, um, So suppose then you have like uh, uh something similar is like uh the maybe what do you call it the maybe monad right. 
So suppose that you have a function uh, that only adds one if it's uh, uh, odd number. Okay. So if it's an even number, okay, if it's an odd number, um, we'll just add one to the And if it's an even number, uh, we don't do anything. Right, we short circuit and we terminate. So you can notice here, right, that this structure is exactly the same, right? That we have an integer, and instead of just returning an integer, right, we return some external extra context around it, right? Similarly here, we return like our extra context, which is a string around it, right? And we want to basically uh, do some chaining as well, like uh, maybe we have like, we wanted to chain add one with odd, and one with even, right? We want to use this same interface, right? Because you can notice that the shape is the same and uh, roughly speaking, okay, I mean, uh, I haven't shown you guys yet, but roughly speaking, right? You should have some intuition that we can do some combination as we did here, like, like through passing away, passing around the results somehow, we can like, uh, get, a, get like the composition of these functions, right? So, like just by looking at the type signature alone, Surely we should get this intuition, right? So this is exactly what we did here. We, we are doing here, right? That we are saying that okay, can we define some operator here that does this as well, right? So now that you see that uh uh the, the kind of patterns that we are talking about, let's talk about um the concrete, I guess, implementation of it. Okay, so yeah. So earlier, right, you can see that uh product type here it's exactly the same as a tuple. These two are exactly the same. It's just uh with the way we are naming them, right, and the way we are like uh constructing them. But these two are roughly the same, right? You should have some intuition of that. Then we have to declare all of these instances. Uh, okay, I mean, you guys can, can try this out on your own time. I won't really go through like why it's needed uh, during this workshop. Um, yeah, you can just try out on your own time. But here, you can notice that we did the exact same thing that we did just now, right? As long as it has a monoidic instance, we can just add them together, right? Similar to the logs just now, we just uh, concat them together, right? And we just do the passing, we just like pass them around, right? So this basically just gives us the abstraction around that. Yeah, and similarly, you can do this for other structures as well, right? Like for lists and for optional types and so on. If you recognize it and you can define uh, instances, right? They obey these laws. You can then say that, okay, yeah, maybe I can define a, a monadic instance. So there are quite a few different like instances that all can be found online. You can just go and Google like uh, monads. So there's the couple, the, the, the one that I just introduced you guys to is known as the writer monad. Uh, so yeah, I guess this is the most like simple, uh, I guess demonstration of how it can be useful. Like when you want to chain these kind of functions together, right? And there are other like kinds of monads that you can see, like uh, list monads, uh, function monad, and so on. That you guys can uh, try to define during your own time. Yeah, but I'll just go through like the laws itself to talk about like uh, the kinds of things we can expect from um, 
monads, like the kinds of behavior, right? So uh, there are three kinds of behavior that we can see. Uh, you notice that these are exactly the same laws as we see in monoids, right? So previously, right, we went through this. Uh, left identity, right identity, and associativity, right? So if you look at this here, this is the thing that we talked about, right? Composing two functions together with this operator here. So this basically just says that uh, if we compose like an identity kind of function, a monadic identity function with another function, it should just return us this function itself, right? So it shouldn't change anything, right? Similarly here, right? So you can see like this is just like very similar kind of uh, patterns that you can see recurring everywhere, like be it integers, list, and so on, that you can see these patterns recurring. Yeah, so this is uh, left identity, which is similar to this. Oops. Okay, this should be, okay, let me just adjust this. Okay. Yeah, so this is left identity, this is right identity, and this is associativity, right? Like uh, whichever way you, you apply them, it should be the exact same. Yeah, so uh, this is very broadly speaking what exactly uh, Monet is. I think this should give you enough intuition to make uh, use of Monet. Um, if you are making use of it in Java, I guess they provide you something known as flat net in Java. But uh, yeah, I mean, function, functional programming in Java is a bit weird. But uh, yeah, you can use this in uh, other languages like uh, uh, Probably Python or JavaScript also has like libraries that allows you to do like monadic stuff. So yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I won't really go through it in detail. I'll just uh, the main purpose was to provide you guys uh intuition with regards to monads. So yeah, uh, you guys can try to define like uh monads based on the laws here later. Uh, for other kinds of types as well. Yeah. And I think that is it. Uh, for applicatives, uh, I think it's a bit, uh, I, it's kind of out of the scope because it's not really happening much uh, inside like real world progress. Uh, okay, it does happen, but only occasionally. So uh, I'll leave you guys to explore this. Um, I have de defined like a monoidal instance here. So you can see here that it also ties in to the idea of monoids, right? But this is on like the functorial context level. So you guys can try this out on your own time and just like see what, what exactly um, the behavior is for like applicatives. Yeah, so I've defined instances for applicative functors for list and for maybe types. So you can, you can try it out and just take a look and see what, what, what exactly is. The laws are here as well. So you guys can try it out as well. And yeah, that is it. Uh, if you guys want, I can provide uh, more, more examples for certain things like I didn't really cover the other instances. I didn't really cover the other instances for monads. I can cover like a uh, state or like a uh, reader monad uh, in future workshops, I guess, or provide examples of them. But all these can be easily found online as well. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, that's all for me. Is there any questions? Okay, so for all that, that instance, 
this. Okay. Yeah. So do you understand these two parts? Okay. Then this is the part that's confusing, right? So let's see, like let, let, let's like step through a uh, concrete example, right? To see like how this actually makes sense. So okay, suppose we have like uh one and we have one. This is the most basic example, okay? So here, okay, let's just follow the exact thing that we just okay, we will step through it. So first we deconstruct, right? We will remove the outermost uh sub uh successor data constructor. Okay. So it becomes this. Okay, so this part should be here. Okay, yeah, you can type check. Um, but okay, yeah, this anyway, this part should be here, right? We do substitution. So you notice that we move the sub uh the successor constructor here, just like reduce it here, right? And then this evaluates to Because I mean, uh, anything plus new itself, right? This addition essentially, right? One plus zero is just one. Okay. Okay. Next, I'll provide you another example. One plus uh, two plus two, maybe. Eh? Yeah, two plus two. Then after that, I'll show you like the analogy to recursively adding or subtracting numbers, right? Then that will be clearer. But first, I'll show you the example of uh successor sorry of, of doing this for like um uh natural numbers so okay so this is two okay and same thing here right what we'll do is of course we'll destructure it and just provide the external successor here Okay, and then we'll recursively apply again, right? And then finally, we'll get Which is four, right? Which is uh two plus two, right? So that's exactly what like uh is expected. So let's just see like okay, this recursive uh application, how we do it like with just normal numbers, right? So it's kind of analogous to addition, right? So we do two plus two. Let's do the exact same thing. So what is removing the external successor equivalent to? So I'll just uh so we remove the external successor which is equivalent to decrementing our natural number by one okay so inside will be right then outside here we add one to it right So if we do this recursively, right? You notice here that it, we just recursively subtract one until it becomes zero, 
And at the same time, we just accumulate ones on the outside. Like we just keep adding ones to this, right? So this will then evaluate to one plus three plus one. And you can recursively do this one plus. And finally, this is just two plus zero. And this just gives us this, right? And you can see then roughly how it evaluates to this as well. So you can see it's like what we're trying to do here. So is this explanation clear? Okay, great. Any other questions? Yeah, if not, um, okay, I won't really cover the other like monads in this because it's quite. I guess quite heavy. You should first understand the example that I gave you guys. And if you want to know more, just like uh, send me an email or send me a telegram. I will explain like the other monads as well. Uh, I, I just wanted to give you some like uh, explanation about like why would you use a monad. Yeah, not really like talk about uh, a comprehensive uh, understanding of what a monad is. Like, why is that you use it? Yeah. So if you guys want to know more, just send me an email. I can. Or we set up a session to explain to you guys what's a what's a monad and uh, applicative functors and so on. Yeah. Okay, I'll just I guess leave it on for like five more minutes. If there's no other questions, then I'll close the call. Let me just push up all of the stuff so you guys can can assess solutions. If you guys have any other questions like about working with Pesco as well, you can ask me. Uh, yeah, I mean, I use it, I use it in, my, in my workplace currently, so you guys can ask me if you guys are curious about uh, me using Pesco.
Okay, so that's it for today. Thanks for coming in to listen in on this Tesco workshop. If you guys have any uh, questions, you guys can email me again. Um, yeah, I can go in more into details about like alternatives and uh, monads. And okay, I mean, uh, some of you may find it interesting. I, I work like with uh, types as well. So they talk about like type level programming as well. So if you're interested, you can also reach out to ask me more about that. Um, yeah, and that's it. Uh, yeah, thanks again for coming. I'll be leaving off. Bye, guys.